Um, we were supposed to be in the other room, but we've been moved to here. And so don't be expecting my talk to be as good as Kevin John's or anyone else who is here. So I'll try my best. Um, I'm just hoping everyone can understand my accent. Yeah, everybody good, yes? <laughs> no, I'm not from around here. <laughs> um, so I'm here today to talk about um, a mobile app development framework called Ionic um, and how we, we have used it as an agency um, in conjunction with Juno. So I'll just introduce myself. Um, my name is Ray Lawler. I'm House Creative in Belfast, Northern Ireland. Um, I've been freelancing with Joomla since 2010, um, and then I joined Elmhouse Creative in 2013. Um, we specialize solely in Joomla site building, so every site we've done is in Joomla. And in 2015, we began, we began uh, building uh, mobile apps, and that's our website there, okay? Um, so I was going to ask for a show of hands about you know, if everyone in the room understands the different types of apps there are, are. Um, if everyone understands it, I can skip a few slides, but if you want me to go through it, I will. Yeah? Yeah? Well, I'll go through it. So there's, th there's three different types of uh, mobile apps um, that you can build. Um, the first is native. Uh, there's HTML5 and there's hybrid. Um, just a spoiler alert there, there's um, Ionic is hybrid. Uh, so, what is native? Native is an app that uses the device's platform code. So um, on iOS, it's Objective-C and Swift um, with Xcode, and Android uses Java and uh, Android Studio. These apps are built inside their own platforms. All right, so if you want to build an iOS app, you have to download Xcode, which is app uh, Mac specific, and you use Objective-C and Swift to build the app out. There is very little relation ship between that code base and what we'd be used to as web developers. So what are the disadvantages and advantages of going native? Um, the main advantage is when you go native um, is that it, it's unlimited. Every app that you've ever used on your mobile phone, um, things like games and utilities, probably are using the native, the native platform. Um, people say that it's faster to use native. I've put a question mark there because that's a reputation that dates back to 2010, 2011, when hybrid and HTML apps were, had the reputation of being slow and unresponsive, but it's 2017, and things have improved, which I'll explain later. <clears throat> and the apps are fully featured. <clears throat> Disadvantages of native is that it's a steep learning curve for web developers and designers like us. You're having to learn a completely new language and a completely new framework. Um, so that learning curve is quite steep. And the big one, f f as an agency and as, as a business person, um, you need to maintain multiple code bases for each app. So if you have an app on the iOS store and a, you have an app on the Android store, those essentially are two different apps with two different code bases. If the client comes back to you and says, oh, I need a new feature, you have to write two features, one for iOS and one for Android, and one for Windows Phone or whatever. So the cost and the time then starts to, you know, expand, and that isn't, it's bad news for you as a developer or as an agency, and it's bad news for the client because they're wondering why they're paying twice for the same thing. All right, so what is HTML5? So HTML5 app um, only uses HTML, CSS, and J JavaScript for the app. They usually exist on the web, so if you've ever seen a mobile app that had an accompanying website, and they look exactly the same, that's a HTML5 mobile app. And they, they mirror each other. Um, so usually these apps exist inside a little, um, a little container within the app. What's that, sorry? Like an iframe. Yeah, like a little iframe container. It's not quite like that, but it's, it's, a little, it's a little like an iframe. And the app will just go onto the web and get all the stuff back. And it, you're looking at it, and it's, it, it looks like an app, and it feels like an app, but it's, it's, all, it's basically a, a responsive website. All right, so what are the advantages and disadvantages of a HTML5 app? So, Obviously, it's easy for us to learn. We, I'm assuming there's developers in the room, most of us, right? We all know HTML, we all know a bit of CSS, maybe. I don't, but <laughs> I'm not a designer at all. But um, We all know a bit of JavaScript, we use jQuery, you know, we, we know the, the technology. So for us to build one of those mirrored apps very quickly, we could just put our 
responsive website inside the little iframe, and we're good to go. So what are the disadvantages? It sounds brilliant, doesn't it? You can just write your little responsive website and stick it on the App Store, done. Well, the disadvantages are that you don't get access to the phone's features. So we use our phones every day, and we use things like the camera, we use the step counter, we use um, geolocation for maps, we use things that the device has. Things, even I, I was reading earlier on today, there's a little plug-in for the, uh, the flashlight. You can have your app access the flashlight. The, the problem is these HTML5 apps don't have access to those features. Okay, go ahead. No, exactly, exactly. There are ways around that, but it's not within the scope of this, really, and it's, you know, if you're gonna go as far as trying to make it available offline, there's other options which I'm about to show you. All right, and again, this question mark over the slowness of it, like I said, it's 2017, they're not as slow as they used to be. All right, so, oops. So, the third one on the list was hybrid, and this is what I'm here to talk about today. Hybrid is essentially HTML5, except it will allow the developer to access APIs for using the device's native features like camera, geolocation, flashlight, and contacts. So basically what we're talking about here is the HTML5 idea, only the, there are JavaScript plugins that allow us to kind of access the phone's device features, things like camera and geolocation, et cetera. Um, and it, this is all built on web technology, so everyone in this room will have the skills to jump into this, I hope, and have a go at it because it's well within our capabilities. And hybrid allows us to put fully featured mobile applications on the, on the App Store. At the minute, there's hundreds of plugins on the web for free on the Cordova website, which I'll show you later, that allow us to do some of the most amazing things. And the differences between a native app and one of these hybrid apps are so slim. Like the most users, unless you're a real power user, won't know the difference, all right? So what are the disadvantages? Sorry, what are the advantages and disadvantages? Um, again, I've mentioned all these. It's easy for us to get started as web developers. This is, this is the big one here for, for us as an agency, this cross-platform one code base. Hybrid apps allow us to build one code base for an iOS app, uh, an Android app, and a Windows Phone app from one code base. So if the client ever comes to us and says, oh, we need a camera feature on this app that you built for us six months ago. We write that camera feature into one code base, which is HTML5, um, the hybrid technologies, and then we push it out to all the app stores, and it's, it's one, one uh, development cycle. It's low cost for the client, they're happy, we're happy, and it, you know, it's great. And then it accesses the native features, like I've just said. So what are the disadvantages? Well, there aren't any, none that I can see. Go ahead. Yeah, yes, you can use it offline. It's, if you, Ionic plugs into uh, progressive web apps. Um, you're like, you, you know, there's ways of doing it. There's internal memory on the phone that you can access as well. That's much outside the scope of this talk yeah, because you know it's quite complex, but it can be done. All right. So this is the little graphic I pulled down from the web um, a few weeks ago that kind of charts out exactly where hybrid apps sit. So here we have native, which is single platform, full capability, or HTML5, which is partial capability, but on multiple platforms. And there we go, hybrid sits in that nice area where it's multiple platforms and full capability. And that's, uh, I should credit that actually. I can't remember where I got it, but. Um, and what I'm about to show you now is a little tweet that I picked up yesterday <clears throat> on my way up from Gatwick Airport. Um, Justin Willis is one of the Ionic developers, and this is what he tweeted out yesterday, which kind of sums up exactly where the ethos is when it comes to hybrid versus native. All right. The web by design strives to create or cater for everyone. Native does not. The web is the platform of the people. So we're all web developers. We've developed lots of websites. Uh, the app space comes along around 10 odd years ago, whatever it was, and suddenly we're, out, we're outside the gates looking in, <laughs> how do we get into this? Well, Ionic and platforms like it allow us as web developers to get right into the middle of that space. And in fact, I think, uh, my professional opinion, I would say hybrid is kind of 
on the way back. I mean, it's, I think it, a few years ago it took a bit of a hit because Facebook, you might remember, went hybrid with its app. And it lasted a few months. They very quickly went straight back to native again. Because those were the days where hybrid was still catching up a bit with speed and responsiveness and stuff. I can see them trying again pretty soon, maybe. We don't know. But um, for, for us, we're, we're not developing Facebook. <laughs> For us, you know, as an agency and as web developers, hybrid does everything we need. Right. So, Ionic. More for time, yeah. Ionic. So, what is Ionic? Off the website, Ionic is the top open source framework for building amazing mobile apps. Right. It's built by Driftico in Madison, USA. It's MIT licensed. I don't know if anyone knows about licenses, but MIT is really good licensed. You can just basically take it, do exactly what you need with it, without any going back. Similar to GPL, just a wee bit more open. It's heavily intertwined with the Angular project. Anybody familiar with Angular? Yep. Um, then you'll know over the last few years what it's been like. The jump between Angular JS and Angular. You know, there was a time where Ionic could have been finished because no one knew what was happening with, with Google. Uh, Google developed Angular. Don't get confused between Angular JS and Angular. They're totally different things. Um, and actually, Angular is going to Samvar at the minute, so they're on the Angular 4, I think. Angular 5, maybe a couple of months away. Angular 6, another couple of months, you know. So Angular JS, the old platform, um, still an active development, but should not be cons uh, mixed up with, with Angular. Um, Ionic uses TypeScript, which is a superset of JavaScript. So TypeScript is a, a new way of writing JavaScript. And then that JavaScript uh, that TypeScript is compiled down to vanilla JavaScript at the end of the process when you compile it. That JavaScript that it produces is unreadable, so don't bother. <laughs> you just write your TypeScript, it gets compiled, and you have lovely working code. Um, it uses SAS for styling. Any, sty any CSS guys in the room? Yeah. You use SAS? It's brilliant, isn't it? I'm told. <laughs> I'm, not a I'm not a designer, I'm not a front ender, so. It's, I've seen it though, it's great. You can use FL statements and stuff and you can do lots of pre-processing, wonderful. And actually uh, Ionic does something, another thing on, on SAS as well. It gives you sort of modular control over SAS and stuff, but you guys will work that out. <laughs> um, it's built on Node.js. Anybody familiar with Node.js? Of course you are, aren't they? Um, it's, I'll not go into it too much here because I'm not a Node expert at all, um, but um, I'll get into it later, but you know you don't need to know too much about it, right? So, and the key thing about Ionic is it has pre-built CSS components that look like native. So when you create a list, it looks like a list how it would look on a native app. If you have a little hamburger menu in the corner, it, it looks like it would look if you programmed it on the UI kit that, that the native has, all right? And that's important because it makes your apps look as if they're native without them being native, all right? So I'm going to very quickly explain Node.js and not go any further into it, but. Uh, Node.js runs a server for JavaScript on your local host, all right? Um, it runs, it's a little bit like running XAMPP or MAMP on your local machine for PHP, although some of the Node guys in there room are probably kicking me up the ass for saying that, because it, it's a lot more than that, but for our purposes, that's basically what it does. It runs a little local host server for you. This is important, this is, NPM is Node Package Manager and handles dependency, so NPM is a way of very quickly using the CLI to get all the dependencies for the app, so all the third-party code that your app needs. Um, and it does it in a clever way. Um, all you need to know is the little um, terminal commands to get them, and they all disappear off in the node folder outside your app, and then they're called upon and stuff, you don't need to worry about it. Um, and then um, uh, there's a, there's a pre-packed gitignore file that kind of keeps it all out of the road, and anything you commit to the cloud is all kind of very, um, uh, kind of lightweight, you know. I've said there, NPM is a lifesaver. Anybody who uses NPM, you'll probably agree with me, yeah? NPM is a lifesaver. Um, <laughs> it just is. <laughs> but it requires basic CLI knowledge, and I've said there, don't run away. So everyone, is everyone in the room comfortable with CLI? No, yes, no. Don't worry if you're not, because yeah, I'm the same, honestly. I'm standing on stage, I've, we've built, you know, five fully featured apps for our clients. I'm still like, oh, CLI. You know, because I'm a PHP guy, you know, built Joomla websites. CLI was a bit of a mystery, and 
you know, for, for this, all you really need to remember is just remember the commands you need to run and then just kind of forget about the rest, you know. But CLI should not be the barrier between you and running Ionic apps. It really shouldn't because the, the, the commands are really, really simple. All right. Whoops. So Angular, um, I said earlier, don't confuse it with AngularJS, especially if you're on web looking for help. Make sure you've typed in Angular or Angular 2 whenever you're doing your search because AngularJS is completely different. All right. Ionic used to run on AngularJS or Angular 1 as it's sometimes known. Um, but it's completely different, so it shouldn't be confused. Um, Angular is a web application framework. In fact, you can build websites with it. It's, it's not just from mobile apps. It's just it uses web components and stuff, and it, you can build progressive mobile apps and stuff, and it's really, it's fantastic. Um, it's built by Google. It uses, it, if I was to sum up what Angular is, um, it uses, it, this is kind of key, it uses um, logic inside your HTML. So you can do things like if, else, and for each, and the, the JavaScript framework in the back, in the back end kind of reads your Angular and says, oh, that's a for each, and it iterates what you've done, and it's kind of, it kind of, it, it, it said there it's easy DOM manipulation, forget jQuery. Uh, it's honestly two weeks of using Angular and you wonder why you've ever put jQuery on any website, because it is so, it's, Angular is so simple, and it does all this stuff really, really well. In fact, it has this thing called two-way data binding, which we'll not talk about too much today where you have your data, which is usually like a JSON object, um, and you have your view, which has like this for each stuff, and you change your data, the view automatically updates, so if you delete something out of your object, bang, it's gone from your HTML. You put something into your HTML with a little form or something, bam, it's in your data again, and it just, everything syncs, it's just beautiful. Beautiful, I can't, I can't kind of stress enough how brilliant Angular is, just go and try it, all right? Um, this is where it gets tricky though, it uses TypeScript. <laughs> And TypeScript, like I said earlier, is a superset of JavaScript, so it's this new kind of way of writing JavaScript that gets compiled down to normal JavaScript. I'm not gonna go into ES6 and 5 and all that today, because oh, my head will explode, but it's built by Microsoft, and I think actually last year, the Joomla Day, the guy from Microsoft talked about this. So if anyone was there, you'll kind of know what, what's going on. Here's what's cool about it. It allows you to use common coding structures like classes and private functions, et cetera, Big caveat here, in layman's terms, it makes JavaScript behave a wee bit more like PHP, right? Sort of, <laughs> I'm, try I'm trying to kind of play to the audience. If you're familiar with PHP, some of this will make sense to you, you know, because you have classes and you have dependencies and you have private functions, public functions and all that kind of thing. Uh, you know, any, any TypeScript experts in the room will, will hate me now for saying it, because it, it's not like PHP, but it, it kind of is for our purposes, you know? Um, like I say, it gets compiled down to normal everyday JS, and we write Ionic and TypeScript. So look, um, last thing here. So it uses a thing, they, our framework uses a thing called PhoneGap. I'll, I'll do this very quickly. You write your HTML5, you write your CSS, your SAS, and you write your TypeScript. You test it, it's all working in your browser. When you're ready, you send it to PhoneGap. PhoneGap gives you an iOS app in native code. It gives you an Android app in Java. Windows, whatever, and it gives you your app, basically, that then can be sent to the app stores. So Cordova is a little processor for your, for your code that gives you the native app at the end of it. All right, again, it runs in the CLI, so there's a couple of commands to learn, but not too bad. Um, it's, Cordova's open source, but PhoneGap is actually owned by Adobe, right there, yeah? And they have, Adobe have, have kind of taken the open source project and made PhoneGap, but, and they've given like enterprise level bits and pieces for it, but you can just get it for free. It's Cordova's open source. Here's, here's the cool thing, it's, it has an extensive list of plugins for device features and web integrations, so I'll just jump into Chrome here and I'll show you some of the plugins. So I've done a little plugin search just when we're out in the coffee room. Um, these are some of the plugins, so you can like, yeah, you can get like Bluetooth, um, AppSocket, Android, Amazon, you have PayPal plugins, you, it gives you access to the geolocation, the accelerometer, the, uh, there's like tons of them here. Oh, there's too many even to, there's a one password one, anybody use, anybody use one password? It's great, isn't it? Our agency uses it, fantastic. There you go, there's a one password plugin for your, app, for your app. So if you have any login screens or whatever on your app, you can hook in one password, it's pretty cool. Um, there's tons here. I could go. Through, I could. I could make the whole talk about these plugins. They're amazing. Um, there's YouTube Android Player. There's tons of stuff. So the camera one will be in here. The accelerometer one will be in. The geolocation will be in there. 
the flashlight one will be there if you ever wanted an app that accesses your flashlight. It's in there. You just install it with your NPM and it's done. Let me just go back to the talk then. So yes, there's, there's the URL for the plugins if you want to jot it down. Just very, it, a Google search, you'll get it. Just type in Cordova plugins. They're all open source. Andy, it's quite quick. Are there any that are paid for in other third party sites? I, no, I don't think there's any. We've never had to pay for any. I'm, I'm sure there are probably third party developers somewhere who maybe sell you a particular plugin, but most of them there. I don't think you're ever going to need some really specialized thing. And if you do, you probably develop it yourself. It's all JavaScript. Right, so the process, let's get into the good stuff. Am I right for time? Still, yeah, not overrunning. Process, so the anatomy of an Ionic app. So at first, I'm gonna show you the files in a second, but when you see it, you'll recognize it because it looks like a website. There's an index.html opening page. Um, but the way it works is we, we do all the work in an SRC folder that gets compiled into the www folder, the www folder, and that's where the app exists, all right? Um, I'll just show you the code here. Let me just see, is it? Yeah. So there's two, two main folders there. There's the SRC folder, which is where we develop our app. Then there's the www folder where the SRC folder gets compiled into. Do you understand what I mean there? It's, you know, you do your work, the gulp runs, the automated task runs, and everything gets compiled into www, and that's where um, the app exists, basically, and, and, and where the browser will read it when you're doing your testing. There's that little magic node modules folder. If I open that, it'll scare you. I can't because it's an image. But it's like, phew, you know, it's 300 megabytes of stuff. It's all the third party stuff, but it doesn't get um, committed with all your get commits and stuff when you're doing this. It's kind of exists outside. And then I'll not get into resources or hooks on this talk, but resources where you have your, your app icons and stuff and your splash screens and that kind of thing. That all comes later. All right, so that's the anatomy of, of an app. So we, you see there, we've got pages, we've got apps, we've got providers, assets, theme. So you do all your SCSS and say, your theme. Um, there, you, the providers are like an API layer. You've got your pages in there. I can't open this because it's an image I'll show you later. Um, but you just have all your app pages inside pages and they all have their own little HTML file. It's very simple. <laughs> it is. Right, so the Ionic CLI, there's a huge bit on the ionicframework.com website that talks about the CLI. And give it a wee read, it's, it's really, it's amazingly useful. Um, so to install, um, after you've installed Node, you have to install Node, make sure it's running on your machine. It's just like a little executable file. Once you're in, um, you've got uh, Node installed and you're, you run uh, npm install global Cordova Ionic and that puts Ionic on your machine and puts it on globally. And Ionic has three starter templates, so they've been really handy. They've got um, a blank one, which just gives you a blank sheet to start with. Then you've got tabs, and we've all seen those apps with the three tabs at the bottom, you know, little icons. And then the other one is side menu, so you have a little hamburger on the side. It opens out a menu. To give you that for free, you can just install one of them. Um, GitHub is chock full of starter templates for Ionic by third party developers. Some of them are really complex, like, there's one actually for a, a tech conference that you can just download and use. It has all the features that a tech conference would need on an app. You know, which speakers in which room, the whole thing. It's free. Um, so once you run this, NPM runs and grabs all the files you need from GitHub, and you enter, you enter your folder by running CD, then the app name that you give the app, and then you run Ionic Serve. So look, let's, let me see what's next. So serving. I'll just talk about serving first before I go and actually show you an app, okay? So when you type Ionic Serve when you're inside your Ionic app, what happens is Gulp is running in the background. Everybody, everybody familiar with Gulp? Yeah? Gulp runs and compiles the JavaScript inside your SRC folder, puts it all into the www folder, and that's where the browser goes in and reads what you're doing. You make a change inside your, your TS files or your HTML, you hit save, Gulp runs again, and then your browser updates automatically. So you can just be, ty you can just be typing and coding with Chrome on the side and you just be developing as you go, and you can just preview it, and it, you know. The only thing is you can't, you can't really preview phone functions like camera and stuff, but there's a, there's a mock system, which I haven't used yet, um, but it's there. You can actually mock up things like cameras and stuff, and flashlights and geolocation on your, on your phone. 
Um, well, sorry, on your on your browser while you're while you're going. Um, so there's a great wee tip here. If you're ever going to do this, run ionicserve labs. I'll show you it here in a second. It opens up the Chrome browser and gives you three screens: one for iOS, one for Android, one for Windows Phone. You can turn each one off and stuff. It's amazing, isn't it? It's great. Um, and you can see the difference between what it looks like in Android, what it looks like in iOS. You do it all live. I can't stress enough how good this is, <laughs> right? It's amazing, right? So look, let's, I'll tell you what I'll do, right? I'll, I'll jump in to the CLI here, and I'll install, just on the desktop. And so all I need to type here is, anybody, everybody see that all right? You need to zoom in maybe. Right, just ionic. Uh, start, and then an app name, so it just says JDay, all right? Um, let me just make sure I have that right. Yeah, app name, I'll just leave it blank, it's fine. Because this is not the project I'm gonna show you. So th there, that's the CLI running. It's going to GitHub now and getting all the files. Takes a, takes a minute or two, so we'll move on while it just does its thing in the background. <clears throat> and I'll, uh, I'll serve you the app that I already have. So what I'm going to run here is Ionic Serve. Actually, I may as well do Labs because it's impressive. So I created this JDA UK project a couple of days ago just for the purposes of this talk. And actually, I'll, I'll put up the GitHub repo at the end of the talk. You can go and download it. What I've done with it, I've created six branches, stage one through to six, where I put code in on every branch. And you can just jump between the branches. I'll show you now how that works. And um, um, I so did this a few days ago. and. I'll just run Annex Serve Labs, and this will kick open my Chrome browser with the app that I'd done the other day. It takes a second to get going, but once it does, there we go. All right, so this is the Welcome to Ionic app. This is kind of running as we, as we go. There's a little quick reference here at the side. I'm just going to close it. And you see up here, it says Platforms, and I've got iPhone ticked. If I just click Android, that's what it looks like on Android, and that's what it looks like on Windows. And you can see the differences because it's a tabs app. There's the little tabs at the bottom, and, but Windows puts them at the top. And that's just the differences between the platforms. And this is why Ionic is so good because it mimics what a native app would do if you were just to write this code in. in your, yeah. Oh, apologies. Thank you. Um, so yes, you can see across all the platforms what can be developed. All right. Um, so I'm just going to make sure I'm on the right branch, actually. What am I on? Yeah, stage one. So this is, this is um, I'm going to pull up um, Adam as well. I develop an Adam, but I think TypeScript has its own thing, isn't it? Um, what's it called? Visual Studio Code. It's the Microsoft's own TypeScript editor, which has a lot, lots of features. I still like using Adam. In fact, I'd rather use NetBeans, because <laughs> I'm a PHP guy. But Adam's good for this. All right. I might need to zoom in here. So basically, these are, there's the SRC folder that was sent earlier on. Um, we've got a home file. Um, I'll just show you quickly. Can everybody see that's kind of faded out? Let me just see. It's on. It's on the talk. It's on the uh, keynote. Let me just see. There we go. No, 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 no. Um, it's further up, isn't it? I don't have it here, but. Um, Basically, every page, no, it only, it only increases that, but every page has three files. There's the, under home, it has home HTML, home SCSS, which is where all your styles go, and then home.ts. So I'll just go back to the slides, actually, because it does explain it pretty well. So this is how a page works. So each page consists of three files, the markup, the style, and the logic, right? So anyone who's done Joomla development will know the MVC architecture that we use. Got your logic, you've got your view, you've got your controllers, but it does it slightly differently. It has one file that's the model and the controller, and it has the markup. Because of the way Angular works, you've just got this two-way data binding between the logic and the, the view, and it's, it updates live. Um, and then CSS is just your styling for that particular page. 
Um, it's similar but different, I've said there. So it says there, like the page.html file is the markup of the page, SASS is the style, the TS file is where all the logic is, like the PHP. So I'm gonna try and give you, um, yes, where's the, yeah. So this is the typical TypeScript, Angular TypeScript page, Ionic TypeScript page. So I'm gonna try and break this down for any PHP developers, go ahead. Yeah, you can, that's in the themes folder. I'll, I'll quickly, I'll show you it. I'll show you it. It's, it's, you, you, can write, you can write the style for your entire app in one place, but if you need any specific SSS, it overrides, it's cascading. So it overrides on a page by page level. So, TypeScript, here we go. Everybody take a deep breath. First thing we do is we import all the dependencies from the node modules folder way back that I was telling you earlier on. So this, every page needs the component from Angular Core, that's the very basic bit of logic that it needs. Now you never have to know what component does away back in the, in the node module files. Don't worry about it. It just basically says that this is now a component from Angular. The next thing we import is from, it says they're from Ang uh, Ionic Angular, so now we're actually loading Ionic stuff. So you've got, I was saying earlier that Ionic sits on top of Angular. It's like, well this is what, this is what we're doing. We're loading our Angular stuff, now we're loading our Ionic specific stuff which is Ionic page, nav controller, nav params, loading controller, et cetera. And um, I'll get into that later. And then, so what this next bit is, this, the wee at, at symbols here, you can think of this a wee bit like the XML for a Joomla module. It basically, it's a little manifest for the, for the particular class. So you can say what our selector is, that's our, actually our CSS selector. You can change that and stuff there, you can, you know, and you can start to target CSS. Then the template URL, it's basically saying we want to pull in jarticles.html, which we'll get to. That's basically saying this JS, this, this JavaScript, this TypeScript file relates to this particular markup. So remember saying like the TS and the HTML work together? Basically, you have to tell the TS which, which HTML you actually want to manipulate. And then this is where it gets easier for PHP guys because and this is what I found the most easy when I, when I approached this to begin with, was we export a class, and then when I see the word class, I'm thinking, yes, PHP class. Works like when I work with the zoo, you know, the zoo CCK from Utheme. I do a lot of work inside that. It's just loads of classes with functions within those classes. You call the classes, you call the functions, it's, it's easy. Just like the PHP, we declare any public and private variables. Then we have a constructor. Everybody, any PHP developers in the room will know you run a constructor when the class gets called, same thing. We have a constructor where we set up some of our parameters and then we call this function on, on the construction as well. So once a page loads, the constructor runs, this, art, this uh, function runs, this is the function. And again, it just looks like a, it looks like a PHP function. Function name, parameters. Between the two curly brackets, you have all your logic. Now I know there's stuff in there that isn't recognizably, for a PHP developer isn't really recognizable, but it essentially runs the same way. So just to recap, we import what we need. We tell the system what this is all about, I, like an XML manifest. And then we have our class where all the logic. So that, that's kind of, any PHP developers kind of nodding along, yeah, that's kind of easy to understand. All right. <laughs> right, so how the view and the logic work together. All public functions and variables inside the TS file are available inside the HTML. So if you have a public function, inside your class, you call it in your view, they'll speak to each other. If you have a private function inside your class that isn't available in the HTML, it's a private function that works on other functions within the class. Right, uh, Angular gives us this two-way data binding thing, so actions in the views are sent back to the class. So if we delete, say if we have a list, and you've seen those lists before, if you have a text message list inside your message app, you slide across and you hit the delete button. That message is sent back to the, the logic where you can actually action the delete, all right? And in fact, Ionic has those styles with the red button and the wee, has all that stuff built in. So you has the sliding actions and stuff in there. So you don't have to do any extra code to get that stuff. Um, changes to the data anywhere else in the app are sent live to the view. And this is key because if you do a geolocation app, say you want to do like a fitness app where you have a runner going around the park, you write the, the API, the little cord of a plugin for geolocation and speed and accelerometer and stuff they'll be sending live data back and forth from the, from the logic. And you want, you want the little guy, the little runner on your map to go around with them. So you have that constant feedback between the data and the view. You know, like it'll say what your speed is, it'll say how much distance you've traveled and all that kind of stuff. That's just HTML. 
So you want that to constantly update given what the API is telling it. Do you understand what I mean? So the data constantly changes, the view constantly changes, and that's what Angular gives you. All right, I should have done this talk on Angular because it's brilliant. All right. Um, so here we go, Joomla, Joomla, Joomla. This is what we're here for. So Joomla set up. So how do, how do we get Joomla to send some data into an app? Right. We get the data from the website using a component called J Backend, which is on selfget.com, a Spanish company. Brilliant support, brilliant guys. Yeah, they're really good. It's 14 euros. Let's see if uh, the guys <laughs> over in Spain realize how valuable that is to my agency. They would be writing, they'd be asking me to write a check, right? Um, it's, to me, it's worth 1,400 pounds, easy. It's, the most, it's a brilliant component. The component includes plugins for all main Joomla extensions, content, users, K2, Zoo, which we use a lot, because I'm a Zoo developer as well. Um, the search, all of it. It just has all, everything you can put into Joomla, basically. It, it builds an API over the top, which allows you to get the data. <clears throat> the plugins allow us to retrieve data from all parts of Joomla. We do this with simple HTTP calls. So your app basically makes a HTTP call over to your Joomla website, gets the data back, and your app then processes the data. Um, we can use a program called Postman to test the rest URLs. Anybody use Postman? Yeah, it's good. Free, it's a free plugin. It actually, there's a Chrome plugin for it too, but I like using a little standalone app, uh, app for it. I'll just show you. I'll just show you um, Postman quickly. There you go. So I'll show you quickly then how the data comes back. Oh, and I'll show you, I'll show you um, J backend here as well. So this is the Joomla Day UK stuff. If I say get a list of articles, you can't really see that URL there, but basically it says API forward slash get forward slash content forward slash articles, and then I give it a category ID. If I hit send here, you'll see what comes back. Oh, no API key. Goodness, where's it here? Is this API key one? So there we go. I've asked it for a list of categories, and I've done a, a default Joomla installation, so it has two categories, the uncategorized and the blog, which is IDE 2 and 9. You see that data there? It's just a little JSON object of all the data that's on the Joomla website. So I'll just jump over to the Joomla website here. Probably need to log in again, yeah. I'll just show you J backend then, quickly. So components, J backend, I'll need to zoom in probably to show you this. So this is J backend. I'm not going to talk about push notifications, but again, that's another plugin. You can do push notifications. If you want a recommendation for push notifications, there's a great service called uh, OneSignal. Anybody use OneSignal? It's a free service to send unlimited push notifications. Um, there's services out there you have to charge for, and they charge a lot. So if you have if you have 10,000 people who have downloaded your app, you're going to have to pay heavily to get push notifications out to 10,000 devices. They, they do it for free, but they do take a lot of data, so just be warned. Anyway, um, you can do it for free with J Backend as well. So if you have if you've curl set up on your uh, on your um, server, do you, just want, do you just want to come in? You're welcome. <laughs> um, you can actually send push notifications to any of your devices via J Backend. Configurations are a little more complex to set up, um, but it can be done. So this allows you, J Backend allows you to set up API keys. So you have particular API keys on your mobile that can be generated and sent back to your Joomla website to make sure that the app is actually allowed to get the data. But basically all you need to do is in the is it author menu, by the way, I'll just show you the front end of this. It's just a basic Joomla install. I haven't done anything fancy. What I have done is I've set up this little uh, menu item called API, and it's a J Backend request. Um, it gives you options here, so you can have the access type is free, so it's just basically an open public API that anyone, any app, anywhere can, can access. You have user specific, so you have the user plugin for J Backend, which allows you to actually have the Joomla login inside your Ionic app. I'm not going to show you that today because it's actually quite difficult to kind of demonstrate. Um, but you can set up a little login page inside your app that contacts the Joomla website, checks against the user, the user list with the right password, make sure you do it in HTTPS so no one gets passwords. And then your app can actually have the user credentials from Joomla. I can't stress that how brilliantly powerful that is enough. Because you can set up ACL levels on your Joomla. Those ACL levels will apply to your app. So if you've paid content and you have, you've, you know, you've keep subscriptions or whatever you want to have on your, on, your, on your website, 
and you charge people to access like video content or downloads or training materials, whatever it might be. Like you can have the payment plugins on your app and it all speaks to your Joomla website and actually they get the ACL back from the Joomla website that applies to your app. It's just unbelievably good. <laughs> all right. um, we haven't quite gone that far with any of the apps that we've developed. Um, clients just hasn't, haven't needed it yet, but the potential is there to do it. What's uh, good about it too is I was speaking to Noreen last night in the pub. She's a marketer. And actually what she said was the potential for marketing as well because what you have is push notifications. You have your Joomla user list that can be plugged into MailChimp and ACY mailing and you know all the usual marketing channels that you have on your Joomla website can now apply to this Ionic app as well. So just think about the possibilities there. All right. If you need any inspiration to actually go ahead and do something like this. Um, a couple of other options there. I'll move on because I want to show you some I want to show you some uh, stuff. So, uh, right. Let me see. Right. Right, so here's the thing about we use a provider for the HTTP layer. Um, just like in Joomla, we want to separate our content from our presentation stuff. With Ionic, we move our API layer to a different place, so is any, any other page or any other aspect of our app can access that data, and we do it inside a provider, and it just it just singles out that bit of logic, and all the logic is really is a HTTP call that gets data back and sends it onto the view. Um, but we can write providers for lots of different things, like the API for Joomla, but things like the camera and geolocation as well, and then the functions and variables within that provider become services for your app. Okay, code right. So there's the address for the code for this. If you want to take a photo or something, um, I think this slide is picking up somewhere. Potentially. Um, all right, everybody got that? Webcraft NI, that's my old um, freelancing thing when I first joined GitHub. So that's the username. Don't look at any of my other code, please. <laughs> Go ahead. So when you're fixing your app, uh -huh. how do you distribute it? Yes. Right, hold on. What I'm going to show you is I'm going to show you the platform on the CLI. So I'm going to jump, I'm going to. Five minutes, right, well, this is good because I'm going to show you this at the end game on this. I'm going to jump to, look, I, I was looking, I was hoping if we were in the small room to sit down sort of one-on-one -on -one with people and actually show them the code, but because we're in the big room, I haven't had a chance to get through these stages. So basically what I've done is I've created a page, I've added some Angular, I'm writing a function, a little click function that does little pop-up pages and stuff. Skip it, go and have a look in GitHub and GitHub and do it yourself. I'm going to skip to the tidying up, which is branch six. You can see that everything changes, and actually the app on here was all reloading because it's code changed and gulps running. And so we end up with this. I'll just show you then the API actually working. So if I click content, that please wait, it's running. It gets on categorized and blog from our website. If I click in the blog, your modules, this is all the default stuff. All right, welcome to your blog. That's all pulling directly from that little Joomla installation I have up on my test server back home. If, quick, quick thing before I do the, the, the end game stuff. If, if you do an author login and you, you add uh, an article to the blog or whatever, the app just immediately updates. <laughs> you get live content. All right. So I'll show you this then, Peter. Okay. Um, so in the CLI, let me just kill that one. In the CLI, I have to, I have to end serve here actually. So kill serve, right? Um, so I think I need Ionic platform add. I'm going to do iOS. So a wee bit of CLI again. You add the platform for iOS. Yeah. Oh, it's been renamed. It's Cordova. Sorry, it's Ionic. Cordova platform add iOS. Oh, sorry, I'll have to jump on the Ionic website. Sorry, guys. This is the CLI documentation here, by the way. Have a wee, have a wee read that. It's great. So, uh, yeah, it's this one here. So it's Ionic Cordova platform at iOS. I thought I typed that, but. Oh, it's running now. So basically, you add a platform, right? And this is, it, you can add an iOS platform, an Android platform, Windows, whatever, and it's, it exists outside in the platforms folder. Then you compile all your code into the platform. And it's an Xcode, it's an Xcode project. All the code in there is native code. The, the, the uh, CLI, the task that runs, actually converts your JavaScript into native code. I had a real trouble with this. Um, 
because everybody thought that actually, no, what you deliver to the Apple Store is all JavaScript. It's not, it's actual, it's, it's live Xcode stuff that compiles it. Right, so that's, that's it added then. And all I need to run is build. So you run Ionic Cadol with build iOS. Here's it here. Uh, Ionic Cordova. Ionic Cordova build iOS. So what will, what have I done? So what it's doing now is it's taken all our JavaScript, our TS, and our HTML, and it's running it through PhoneGap, the Cordova PhoneGap, and producing an Xcode project out of it, which I'll open an Xcode now for you once it's done. Hopefully there's no errors, because I was coding this a couple of days ago, and I haven't actually tested it that much. Yeah, build succeeded. Good. I'm a brilliant coder. <laughs> um, so if I open Xcode, I and I can go and get open desktop, JDA UK, platforms, iOS, uh, where's the project code? Workspace, so you open the workspace. I'm not an expert in Xcode. I tend to find that the workspace works a wee bit better when I'm doing bits and pieces. And yeah, so that's, we're now, it's indexing and processing the files, but this is the full on Xcode project, right? If you know any Xcode, this is where you can do some magic. But um, I'm not gonna talk about provisioning profiles or anything like that. <laughs> that can be a real problem. But actually, I found that the Android one was, can be tricky. Everybody thinks that the iOS delivery system is quite complicated, and it is. You know, you need to spend some time getting, getting around it. But I found that the Android one was actually much more difficult. Um, anywho, I think, I think we'll wrap it up. Yeah, wrap it up. I wanna say thank you to Rowan for allowing me to speak, and thanks very much for listening. All right. Sorry, we messed up the room.